Welcome to the Fostering Change Podcast, Season 3. I'm Rob Shear, the founder of Comfort Cases and your host. Together, we have made such a difference in the world. We've met with leaders and change makers in the foster care system. We've met with charities and philanthropists, celebrities, authors, and so much more. We'll continue to bring you guests who will share how together, as a community, we can bring about change. Welcome once again to Fostering Change. Well, you know, here we are again, another episode of Fostering Change. And as I say quite often, I am so lucky for to do what I absolutely love to do. And that is to number one, talk to people. And those who know Rob Shear, they know I love to talk. And number two, I get to meet some of the most amazing humans. And I get to educate each and every one of you about some amazing organization. You know, years ago, my husband Reese and I, we had gotten an email an email from an organization that is actually located right in the District of Columbia. And they said that we had been nominated to be angels um, of adoption. Now, mind you, a father of five kids, um, I don't consider myself an angel whatsoever. I make sure that I remind people all the time, for those of us who adopt children in foster care, we are not the heroes. We are not the saviors. We are, you know, building our family. And so when they wanted to give us this, you know, angel of adoption award, I was like, I don't know what this is. So I ended up meeting some people and finding out that this is a pretty big deal. And and the organization that does this does lots of stuff. So we're going to spend the next probably 35 or 40 minutes to educate you about the Congressional Coalition of Adoption Institute, which also has the foster youth internship and program that I am just so fascinated about. All of you that know me, you know that my heart lies with children in the system, but my heart really gets big when it comes to kids kids who are at that point of aging out and when they do age out. So very first person we're going to have today as my guest is I am so happy to introduce Angelique. Angelique, you're the policy director of the, Co the Congressional Coalition of Adoption and Institute. Is that correct? Yes. So tell me exactly what is a policy director? Well, a policy director really keeps in the loop on all things policy. So specific to the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, it is everything under the umbrella of child welfare, foster care, adoption, and really narrow focuses on all of these issues to engage the congressional members and their staff on some of the most pressing issues that children and families are dealing with. And so in my role, that is what I do as a policy director. I know that definition is broad depending on what policy issues you work on, but here at CCAI, it is everything child welfare, foster care, adoption, internationally and domestically. With CCAI, tell our viewers and our listeners, you know, about CCAI. How long have you guys been around? You know, where do you feel your focus? I know you're talking about policy and I know I personally know what you, a lot that you do, but I want those people who are, are listening and watching us, you know, tell me about that. Yeah, well, you know, some time ago, members of Congress actually were interested in these issues, and they created the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Caucus. And so a few years after that, the Institute was created to be the hub for resources and education for members of Congress. And so Outside of just our congressional resource program, we also have the Foster Youth Internship Program, Angels and Adoption Program, and our National Adoption Day um, activities. And so we really want to bring the voices of those who have been impacted by the system, whether it be through adoption, foster care, and the like on these issues and make sure that members of Congress are hearing from the people who are impacted most, the families who are dealing with what they're dealing with to be able to come to really um, knowledgeable policy decisions in their roles. So, you know, um, 
Wow. There's so much I want to say about that. You know, one of the things I will tell you is I'm probably one of the most disliked person when it comes to my opinion. So I will tell you, I'm a very blunt person. I grew up in the system. I aged out of the system. I was homeless from because of the system. And I have adopted five children from the system. So if anybody has a point of view, I feel I'm allowed to have my point of view. And I think that everything you just told me is absolutely amazing. My my problem is, okay, is that I feel that it's a lot of talk and very little action when it comes to those who are sitting up on the hill. And by the way, I have sat in their offices and I have told them my bleeding heart story. And I have listened to other amazing youth from foster care tell their stories, their heart wrenching stories of how we as a community have basically failed them. And I've watched our politicians say, oh my gosh, this can't happen. This can we're going to do. And then I see nothing. And this is my question. If so much is being done, and I came in the system in the late seventies, if so much is being done, why are we not seeing a change in the pendulum of the needle when it comes to only 54% of kids actually graduate from high school who are in foster care? And that's been the same number for about five to six years. That only 3% of kids actually graduate from college that are in foster care. And by the way, that's been a 10-year number. Why are we not seeing those changes in those numbers if so much is happening? Yeah, I think that's a really great question, Robin. Thank you for it. Um, we really have to think about the communication between systems, whether it's at the federal level or at the local level. And it really is a matter of state differences. There's a lot of differentiation when it comes to the kind of services provided in certain states. And I think it's really important for you know, child welfare agencies, child welfare directors, you know, local governors, mayors, I think that everyone needs to be in more communication with one another to really kind of bridge the gap between what a family and a youth need and how best they can in their respective wheelhouses respond to that. And then we also have to think about the child welfare agencies themselves, right? We have staff turnover, we have burnout, we have folks who need more training, they need more pay, and we have to start thinking about the system as a holistic system and how that differs from state to state. There are states doing it better than others. There are states who have programs that can be um, expanded, yet no one knows about it. Um, and I think it's really communication at this point and knowing what's there in your respective locality and state. And then in doing so, you can then say to your state senators and representatives like, hey, come see what we're doing here and see how you can bridge that gap also. But, you know, locally, it's really important for partnerships and collaboration and you know, people figuring out where they are in their communities, what's available. I no, I agree. Let me tell you yeah. something. That is one of the reasons why I love CCAI, because you said exactly um, what people need to hear. The very first thing that we need to do when it comes to bringing change is to actually communicate. OK, that's that's the first thing that I feel like we have stopped doing. Number one, we also do not educate our communities. And I, I say this all the time, um, you know, your community is not your zip code. It's our human race. We do not educate our community enough about children in the foster care system. And I understand that you all deal with everything from adoption and overseas adoption. But let me tell you something. I stay in my lane and my lane is foster care. OK, and number one, I will be the first one to say foster care is an industry that makes money on the backs of children. OK, it is an industry that is shattered and it's an industry that we see no change. Um, and having organizations like yours that's bringing light to, as you said, there are states that are doing it right. But the fact is, we all should be doing it right. You know, every, I mean, every single time you give an opportunity to a youth to go to your internship, you're actually investing in every human in the United States 
future. I don't think people realize that. I don't think people realize what all CCAI is doing by investing. I mean, when I I have been lucky enough and I wish, I hope every single body, everyone that's listening to this show and watching this, you've got to take an opportunity to step up to the plate and spend some time with these young, amazing humans who, by the way, are our future leaders, okay? They are our future leaders because they literally have changed my life in ways I didn't even think they could because this old 55-year-old thought he was stuck in his ways. But I want you to tell me about the Foster Youth Internship before we're actually going to bring some of these amazing people on and talk to them. So tell me, what's the Foster Youth Internship? Yeah, so the Foster Youth Internship is a nine-week professional development program that also places youth from across the country who have experienced the domestic foster care system into congressional offices. And while they're in their congressional office, they're also a CCAI intern working on a policy report where they recommend recommendations based on their personal lived experience. And so throughout the summer, we work with various partners to enhance that experience, to learn deeper about policy regulations, agency mandates and guidance, and really are in a research heavy capacity to really formalize those recommendations that the current cohort seeks to talk about. So. For nine weeks, we partner with organizations like yours and others outside of just policy heavy writing and um, the nitty gritty of what that looks like. We get to reconnect with folks from across the country doing amazing work to also um, build their network, meet other people from across the country who are doing some of this work so that if they decide to either stay in the district or go back to their respective states and do the work, they have a strong network as well. So we do a lot in the nine weeks, but um, I'll let the interns get Yeah, so I want to know, before before we take a a commercial break, I I have two questions for you. Um, Question number one, how do they get picked and, you know, how do they apply and, you know, what's the age of a child who that applies? And then my next question is, who pays for this? Yeah, so there is a requirement to have at least four semesters of college experience, higher education. There is no age limit in terms of that you just have had to recently graduate and or have about four semesters of higher education. And in terms of pay, we do not um, require any of the interns who are accepted into the program to pay. It is a fully paid internship program experience with housing paid for, travel paid for, um, and really anything associated with the program activities is paid for. And the application opens on a yearly basis. We will likely be opening it earlier this year um, and anyone can apply. So if you are interested um, and have those requirements, um, we would love to see your application. Okay, so you opened up a lot more questions before I go to commercial break. So I understand that the intern is not paying, which, you know, I Mm -hmm. thank goodness I wouldn't expect that. I want to know how you get your funds to pay for their housing, their transportation. Where do you get funded? Well, you know, we have to make the case to funders and um, let them know why it's so important for this program to exist. And, you know, through their, you know, seeing that this is a a resource to members of Congress, but also, you know, the the conversation in general to really see what that looks like. People, um, you know, are willing to give money to that cause. So, um, you know, I'm assuming and I would hope that since the government is actually those are the ones who tried who built this in the beginning, they do quite a bit of your funding for you. But I love the fact that, you know, there's opportunities for people like me who believe in your organization, who can also go to your website and actually make a donation as well. And by the way, um, everyone who's listening to this and watching this and and can never thank you enough. Um, I say this quite often when I have organizations on, um, there is enough money to go around. 
Okay. And if we as nonprofits would realize if we work together, gosh, just imagine, I said it before we started taping this show, if all of these nonprofits who, you know, and by the way, there's a, I, it, it, just within the last three weeks, I have met so many nonprofits that do very similar to what CCAI is doing. If we would all just come together, okay, and bring our superpowers, we could actually solve child welfare's problem. Listen, we're getting ready to take a break. This has been an amazing conversation, and I cannot wait until part two when we actually have interns who will join us. We'll be right back. This episode of Fostering Change is sponsored by Comfort Cases, a national nonprofit that inspires our communities to bring hope and dignity to our youth that are in foster care. For just $10 a month, you can support the Comfort Case mission and help us eliminate trash bags for kids who are entering foster care. For every $10 that you give, Comfort Cases will give a Comfort XL to a child entering the system. Be part of the change. Visit comfortcases.org. Well, you know what? The first half of this show was absolutely more educational than I expected. You know, as we talked about that CCAI actually was formed by, you know, um, Congress people. I want to clarify the fact that they do not fund it. Okay. They do not donate. Um, that could be a conflict of interest. You know, we all know how that is. You know, we've all seen what happens when, you know, money is put somewhere or maybe it shouldn't. So that tells me even more that those who are listening and watching, after you meet these three amazing humans, go to their website and donate. So this particular program can continue to go on. And you know what, um, Angelique, what I would love to see happen is not only that the program go on, but the program grow. But I do think, and I'm just going to tell you, and again, I told you this in the first half, I'm a blunt guy. I think you're doing a disservice to children and, and our foster care system by only allowing those who have a college education. Because let me tell you something, I actually, you know, graduated from high school by the skin of my teeth. Okay. And at 55, I still do not know how to spell there, there or there. Okay, I'm going to tell you that because the system that you support failed me and I was not able to go to college. And so what I ended up doing after being homeless is I joined the United States Navy and I did become a successful businessman when I was told I was going to be nothing. But gosh, would it have been nice if I would have had an opportunity to do an internship where you are. So I hope your your boss. Thank you for that feedback. That. You know, I, I'm telling you, I yeah. hope your bosses hear that because I think that there are more kids like me, you know, than they are, as we know, only 3% actually get a college education. But so we're going to go ahead and we're going to get right to it. And I'm going to introduce you to who I think are three amazing humans. Okay. And my first person I want to introduce you to is Stormy. Stormy, where are you from? Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Kansas. How long have you been in the system? I was in the system for three years, y'all. Three years, three years. You know, Christina, you know, I am so excited to meet you. I think there was like a little bond you and I got going. Um, by the way, I want to say last night I had the opportunity to go to a baseball game with some of the interns. And um, I don't know if you saw on social media, Christina, but my um, husband, Reese, actually was wearing the hat that you had made for me. And he told me that it was his hat now. So I just want to say thank you. Christina, where are you from? I'm from California. California. And Ryan, Ryan, I actually have followed you on social media. And so I feel like I already know you. So, you know, but tell everybody where you're from and maybe your background gives a little bit of a hint to where you are from. Hi, yes. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. And I was born actually in the uh, Ukraine, actually. I was an orphan over there. That's how I got wrapped up into our Fushker system here. So, Christina, how long have you been, how long were you in the system for? Yeah, I was in the system from birth um, until nine formally, and then I went into informal foster care, which just means that I was placed out of 
I was kinship the entire time, but they placed me out of a different court, but I was still living with family, but they took, you know, those resources away from them. Wow. Ryan, what about you? Hi, uh, yes. I was in in care for five years and three of those were when I was in the extended foster care program. Wow. You know, the fact is, is that, you know, so many times I feel like we do not shed enough light on our youth who are in the foster care system. And, and, you know, I remind people all the time that kids who come into foster care come into foster care because of choices other people made. OK, simple as that. They come into the system because of choices other people made. And for me, I very the, one of the most important things that I've wanted to do for the last 10 years is, number one, to change our vocabulary. Some of you, we've talked about this before in our gatherings, is that um, stop calling us former foster youth, stop calling us foster youth, stop calling us foster children, stop calling us foster kids. You need to direct us like you direct every other human who happens to be a youth, and that is a child, a kid, a young adult. And then if you would like to say that I'm a youth or a young adult who experienced, experienced foster care, because you cannot make foster care make me who I am. And so I'd like to ask all three of you, what do you think about that? Because I've actually gotten backlash from some youth who are, have been in foster as if they wear it as a badge of honor, you know, where I don't agree with that. What do you each think? So, Christina, what do you think? Yeah, um, you know, when we just did our policy brief, I mentioned this. Um, I think that it is tokenizing one um, to minimize a person just to the word foster youth. Like as a 28 year old who has a master's degree, who has over seven years of policy experience, I'm a professional, right? People don't go around and being like, oh, you know, this black person, like just minimizing them down to simply their identity. No one wants to walk around and only be called by their identity because you are more than your identity, right? Your experiences may make you an expert in something. Your experiences may be what you lead from or may, may be what you have to give in a lot of different spaces, but that's not only who you are. And I agree with you. It's not, I'm not a foster youth. I'm a person who experienced a foster care system. But at the end of the day, I'm a professional. I'm an advocate, I'm all these different other things. And I understand um, other people's opinions um, who came from the foster care system about them owning the word foster youth because I think a lot of people take pride in, in wearing that identity. But as from 18 to like now, I've always had a problem with that because I've seen that no matter how much experience I have, no matter what I do, how many degrees I get, when people only trickle me down to a foster youth, I'm underpaid, I'm undervalued, and oftentimes I'm overlooked. Yeah, no, I, I'm going to tell you, 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 you hit the nail on the head, my friend, you're exactly right. And, you know, again, I, you know, and I say this to my kids, you know, I'm not ashamed of where I came from, by the way. And I am never want my children to ever be ashamed of their story, because each and every one of us have a life story, and happens to be that our life stories, my five children, the four of us, Angelique, she also was in the program in 2015. So all of us have a life story that happened to have foster care in our life story, but it did not define who we were. It did not define who we were. You know, I, th I think all the time, you know, when it comes to, to, to resilience, you know, those of us who have been in foster care, or experiencing foster care, we have three choices, okay? We had choice number one, we could give up. We all know on this, this Zoom right now that the majority of our brothers and sisters who are in the system or who have experienced the system have given up. Suicide rate is the highest it's been in children who are in foster care. Number two, we can give in. We can do exactly what our community expects us to do because we have the F word in front of us, which has become drug addicted, teenage pregnancy, school dropout, incarceration, or 
the one thing we can give it all we got. And for what I see with the four of you in front of me, you chose that. So Stormy, I would like to ask, what, where did you get your grit to make sure that you were going to do this? I've always believed I've had that grit in my life. I consider myself a professional failure because I've failed in most things that I've tried to do. And coming from the group home, there are times when I had to fight. Group home life is hell. So just knowing that I've had to fight every day for two years, that's where I get a lot of my grit from. I get my determination to be at the spot today where I am in. It took me 12 years of professional advocacy, nine years to get noticed on a national level, five years of applying for this spot being told, no, 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 not here. And then I finally get here and it took me 30 days to get placed into a congressional office. So that having that dream almost slip away from me right as I was at the table, my grit was the only thing that was keeping me going because a wise man once told me, son, that I'm going to have to grit my teeth and take punches to get where I want to be in life. You are exactly right, my friend. You are exactly right. And I am so proud that you are where you are right now. Ryan, um, let me, I'd like to know what you got out of this experience that this, you know, CCAI was able to, to bring this to you. And by the way, for those who are watching and listening, and Ryan, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to spread, um, spill the beans here. Ryan, as he was in this program, there were two major milestones milestones that happened with you. Um, milestone number one, um, which by the way, um, should be celebrated as we celebrated my sons this year, um, you turned 21. But milestone number two, which is something that um, I will tell you, I love my therapist that I see every Monday, because I would have to have seen, seen my therapist. You legally in your state, you legally aged out of the system. So when you return home to Arizona, okay, you are no longer a part of the system. And so, you know, what I'd like to know is what did you get out of this? Question one. But question two, how do you feel about getting on that plane, going back to a state that you are no longer considered their ward any? I would say that this whole like experience on the hill, like it's something that I've always wanted as a kid and as someone who was not even in foster care at that point and wanted to be on the hill and just have had the opportunity of such like this is just remarkable in itself. I would say when I get back in Arizona and um, the guy feel alone, um, I do have a big a family that I call family, but that like just that isn't even enough. I've always longed for family my entire life and I'm still longing for it. And I'm not sure how long I will long for it and hopefully it will end soon. Well, let me tell you something, Ryan. Um, I am 55 years old. And I am lucky enough to have a husband for the last 18 years who absolutely adores me. And I am lucky to have five of the most beautiful, amazing humans as my children. But I am going to have to be very honest with you. There is not a day that goes by that I do not yearn for a family. And even though I have my children and I have my husband, I still yearn to have that mom that I always wanted or that dad that I always wanted or those cousins or the aunts and uncles. So as, as much as, you know, some people will say, oh, it gets easier or, oh, don't worry, the more therapy you do. Let me tell you something. We have all been given a chapter in a book and that chapter in the book happens to be blank pages when it comes to the, that, that type of family. But what I have learned 
what I have learned, and it has filled that hole within me with some, is that I have done exactly what you did, is I've grabbed some amazing people. And so, for instance, my Grammy, who, you know, just happens to be some a woman and her husband that I met at church many, 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 many years ago, I know she loves me as if I was her own child. So you will, you will fulfill that. I know you will, my friend. Listen, as we're wrapping down, Angelique, I I like to say the fact that number one, you you were in the program in 2015, okay, yeah. and I was rough in the beginning on you, and I I was rough on the fact that you know I don't see change happening. You know, I I I was at a, an event and you know somebody was talking about the billions of dollars that you know we're increasing our budget, and I'm like, you know, my opinion was, well, what did you do with the billions of dollars you already were given? Um, you know it. These are valid questions, though. We have to be curious about how things are being implemented, where the money's going, if it's reaching the intended participants it was intended for, and then, you know, furthering oversight on if it didn't, right? We have to ask those questions, and we always have to be curious about what those outcomes are, because if we expect better outcomes and are not asking the questions along the way, then we're obviously gonna miss someone's and we're gonna miss the mark on some things. And it's the beauty and the curse of programs, right? You're building something and you have to see if it's gonna work. And that's why it's important to ask those questions, to make improvements along the way, to see where bottlenecks might exist. And then to work on that, right? Like we can't expect things to be better if we don't continuously work to make them better. And I think, you know, Christina's point about, you know, being called to foster youth, I really appreciated because after I finished the program, I did go work on the Hill for about four and a half years. And I didn't really talk about the experience. And I did advise a member on child welfare issues. And it wasn't until I actually staffed the member myself that I actually mentioned that I had foster care experience, which they were obviously surprised, but I just appreciated what, you know, Stormy, Ryan, and Christina have had to say thus far. So thank you guys as well. Yeah. And you know what the fact is, is that I love what you said, because, you know, I truly do believe that we do need accountability and we can throw as much money as we want into a system. But if we are not making people accountable of how that money is used, then really there's no point in doing what we do. Listen, I will tell you, this is, I have been so lucky. I think this is my hundred and, you know, 50th, you know, podcast, but I will tell you, this has been one of my favorites. It is one of my favorites, not just because I get to be with people that it's nice to be with people like me. I truly do believe that I have connected a bond. And um, I know this isn't the last time I'm going to see any of you or hear from any of you, because I know there are big things happening for each one of you. And by the way, I want to be a part of it. I want to make sure that I stand there and applaud of all the goodness that you're going to bring. You know, I want to end this, and I've not done this before, but I'm going to end this podcast, and I'm going to ask each one of you a question. And I'm going to ask myself a question first. And that question is because of the fact that I am a, have lived living experience just like each of you. And my question is, if there was one wish that I could get, and that I could do something in the foster care system, what would that wish be? And for me, it is to set every single youth that enters our foster care system up for financial success, which means if you can give a stranger a stipend, then you can take money and put it in an interest-bearing savings account to give people like Ryan, who is no longer in the system, a net to be able to have some type of savings, to be able to have that opportunity for down payment or whatever. But we need to set them up for financial success. Christina, what is your one thing? Yeah, I think that my one thing would be to allow equal and equitable opportunity um, to those who have foster care experience. If you can manage to funnel 
young people into the juvenile justice system, incarceration, um, sex trafficking, and so forth, then you can manage to increase the numbers that go to college. You can manage to increase the numbers that have housing stability. You can manage to increase the ones that are able to reunify um, with their families, right? And so if there's all this funnels into these negative um, outcomes, then we can give the same opportunities and redirect from those negative outcomes into positive outcomes. So that would be my, my one wish. Wow, I love that. I love that. Stormy, what about you? I love to create more opportunities for international travel and up for these youth because I really think that's how you broaden your eyes and get new perspectives. And the first time I ever left the country, that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And I really want other youth to be able to experience that. Yeah. Wow. I love that. You know, my son, Alex, he was he was 18 when he arrived and um, he's now 21. And we took him on his very he got his passport, took him on his very first trip. Um, we went to to Italy for a couple of weeks. And just recently, we just got back from London. And my son is now going getting ready in the spring of 2023 to actually study abroad. And so he has been accepted. He's going to London to study. But he said to me the other day when he found out that he was, you know, going to be able to get accepted, he said, Pops, he was like, do you realize, you know, as a kid growing up in the foster care system, I would have never had an experience to be able to go, if, first of all, have a passport, to go anywhere, but now to be able to have parents who, who love me enough to, to pay for me to go study abroad, I have to agree with you on that, Stormy. I think that that, that experience, you know, very probably much like all of you when you were growing up I mean I there weren't vacations there weren't passports there I the first time I was on the on an airplane was when I was heading to Great Lakes Illinois to go in the Navy at the age of 18 so Stormy I love that Ryan what would you say what would be your one yeah sure for me I would say that the foster system needs to do better by not assuming what young people and families need and secondly all systems need to do a better job at engaging our LGBTQIA AAPI and travel youth and families and very authentically yeah yeah I I agree with you on that and by the way you know everybody you know the fact is is that you know I hope we get to a time when people realize you know as this gay man you know I I that also doesn't define who I am okay so that doesn't define Angelique um we're going to end it with my friend and I'd like to know you know you've been around doing this for a while now you're still young as can be you've seen you've you've done the internship program you've watched these amazing interns turns in and out, coming and going, what would be the one thing that you would change when it comes to foster care? I think the one thing I would change or that my wish would be was, is that um, every youth and family get the case planning that they need and that they deserve equitably and that they're centered in that conversation. And I, I came into this work because of that positive experience with my agency and their level of care and compassion to put me in the room every time a decision was made on my behalf. And so I just, that's my wish that everyone who experiences this system has the ability to speak for themselves and their needs. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I've said this quite often is that I believe that when a child comes into our foster care system, and by the way, we know the statistics, 64% neglect, the, the word neglect is no, no more than poverty. But, you know, so 60, you know, the, the child comes into the system. And as they sit in the system, I believe that what should happen is everybody should come around the table, everybody. And that means that the child doesn't go into foster care. The family, the group. So that means the foster parents are helping, you know, you know, maybe, maybe the, the, the biological parents, they didn't have a role model. Maybe they didn't know. Maybe the fact that we need to, you know, pay a living wage so they can pay for daycare. You know, maybe the fact that we can, you know, 
do so much more. I think that we need to make sure that we try to keep the family intact, you know, as much as possible. Listen, everybody, this has been an absolutely amazing, amazing conversation. I cannot thank each and every one of you enough. I have enjoyed the time that I've spent with you all in the last couple of weeks. I am so looking forward for everyone to listen to this podcast. And listen up, everyone. If you really want to make a difference, if you really want to make change, the fact is, is that you must support organizations that are building the future for tomorrow. And again, I've said this over and over, if you invest in a child today, and I know these are young adults, but if you invest in them today, you actually invest in your future for tomorrow. Until next time, this is Fostering Change. Take care. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for listening or watching the latest episode of Fostering Change. All of us on our team hope that you've learned something new today and have been inspired to be a good human. Now, just a reminder that you can always find Fostering Change on your favorite channels on Google, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and others including, of course, comfortcases.org. I want to give a big thank you to all of you for joining us each and every week. And a reminder that if you have a suggestion for a guest, or maybe you might have a question about today's podcast, or are interested in becoming a sponsor of Fostering Change, please don't hesitate to email me personally at fosteringchange at comfortcases.org. Now, that's it for now. Thanks again, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Take care.